Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm excited to be here with a uh, friend of Modern Treasury, Tom. Um, I'll just start with quick intros and then we can just jump in into the discussion today. So today we'll be talking about you know, building and scaling uh, your application ledger. Uh, that's the ledger database that you use in your fintech product, your marketplace, your vertical SaaS company, or you know, the product that moves money within, within your company. Um, and we'll be talking about the challenges of like building and scaling that, that specific kind of, of database. Um, my name is Lucas. I work on the Ledger's team here at Modern Treasury. Uh, and today I'm joined by, by Tom, who has been a friend of the company for, for quite some time now. So maybe that's a good place for us to start, Tom. Tell me more about your background and, and how, you got, how you, got, you got to know Modern Treasury. Cool, sounds good. So I've been working on FinTech applications for a while now, over six years. Originally, I worked at Coinbase on their fraud and risk team, and so got to witness a lot of very interesting fraud scenarios there. Uh, and then after Coinbase, I started a company and was the CEO of a company called Float, which is basically a corporate charge card and spend management company. Um, and that company uh, ended up raising $47 million and powers like hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, worth of transactions per year. And that was my... Um, kind of really first super deep exposure into ledgers because we built a ledgering system there and we got a lot of things wrong. So after Float uh, started working with an incubator, which basically incubates fintech companies. And so we have now implemented this ledgering uh, solution several times, a couple of times with Modern Treasury and have just like learned and earned a lot of scar tissue from this. And now I'm the CEO of a product studio called Boosted, which is specialized in essentially solving these exact sort of problems. Awesome. Um, when you think about, I guess a good place for us to start is like, you know, ledgering is just one component of the overall infrastructure that you need to build when you're starting a FinTech company or when you're in an existing company and you're adding a product that moves money. Um, and, you know, ledgering is, as a component of that infrastructure is something that is sometimes uh, overlooked or sometimes that is uh, kind of secondary to other elements of your design. Um, what, what's your experience in terms of thinking about building backends and, and building infrastructure in, in FinTech? How important is that ledgering component in, in, in your experience? Yeah, so I think the way I look at it uh, is what CRM is to sales, like a ledger is to a FinTech company basically. So what a CRM is, it's a centralized source of truth for all information that you can rely on. You can plug and hook all these different systems into it um, to kind of get a real-time current view. And that's exactly what a ledgering component does. And so it can integrate in all these systems and it can uh, be able to uh, help you find mistakes and reconcile the locations of your money. I think uh, the reason a lot of companies don't originally start using one is because let's say they use a vendor which they can call and just get a balance out of and so they'll just rely on that vendor essentially providing that but that the second they start adding more vendors and they have to tr keep track it across or they have to fix things uh that creates like a super huge problem for them um mm -hmm. and then also another thing is double entry accounting is like five thousand years old um, yeah. And so something found product market fit 5,000 years ago and everyone uses it um, and it's still being used and it's the default, like you should probably consider also using it to move money. If like right. literally everyone does this uh, and there's like, so yeah, that's kind of my view on that. Yeah. So let's, let's double click on the double entry portion. Uh, how, how scary was the double entry for you when you actually got started building these, uh, uh, you know, ledger databases and, how, how easy was it for you and your team to get up to speed with the core, you know, foundations of debits and credits? It's super scary, I think, actually. Uh, because as an engineer, you're not really exposed to it and you're not thinking about it. And it's just much easier to implement everything as like, here's a balance, like a single entry sort of system. Right. Um, and so I definitely think it's worthwhile. You don't need to get super deep. Like, it's like, you don't need an accounting degree to, to figure these things out. But you do, I think, need to understand the fundamentals of it, and it's super useful, uh, and it kind of helps create a system with natural checks and balances in it. But I will say, like, super scary in the beginning, unclear, had to talk to a bunch of people to figure this out, 
not a lot of content online and kind of books around like specifically these building out like technical accounting systems, basically. Yeah. Did you uh, fall in the trap of building SQL entry systems or you know anyone who fell into that trap? Yeah. Yeah. Like we, we did it. And then I know a lot of people who did it and it, it works, but then you start running into issues around um, basically if something goes wrong or if a balance goes wrong, you start trying to figure out why, yeah. um, when that situation would have literally been prevented had you had a system which naturally has to essentially have safeguards in it. Like that's a, there's a reason of why it exists and has a system of checks and balances. And you you have to, it forces you to, before the accidents happen, think through where the error cases can be and how the system should be properly structured in order to avoid them. Right. So that, that leads me to the next uh, group, group of questions we, we have here, which is, uh, you know, the, the obstacles and the challenges that you face when building and scaling uh, a ledger. Um, maybe we can we can split that into two categories, like the first build out. And we, we talked about the, you know, accounting, understanding and education obstacles being one of them. Uh, curious to hear from you, like what else was kind of an unexpected, non-obvious challenge when you when you got started? And then yeah. we can talk about so, the scaling piece in a bit, because I know that the scaling piece is a, its own beast as well. Cool. Sounds good. So I can start actually the, the the first, my first exposure to this kind of system was uh, when I was working at Coinbase and basically there they had a single monolithic kind of code repo with a transactions table in it that mm -hmm. tr kept track of everything. Um, and basically it was like just built by engineers to meet the, the market needs. Um, but eventually as the system people tried to build new services and new features on top of it it just became a super hairy mess to be able to kind of integrate through it so i think that there that was like a really difficult point i also think the second someone asks you hey like how much funds have been transferred uh into the system and like get some certain data access you start realizing like oh i didn't think about like this is a requirement for the system beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, and you kind of wish that you had um, uh, done those. Yeah. So on, on that one, is it is it about uh, doing proper requir requirement gathering in the design phase and, and making sure that you have your, your finance folks and your business teams kind of like in the loop when you're designing the systems from scratch? Or is it more of the fact that, and, and the meaning of that question is like, a good process would fix it or is it's more the nature of the problem that you can't you don't really know what these edge cases and what these constraints and what these reporting needs will be down the line so you might as well you, you probably have to build a, a more flexible underlying infrastructure yeah i think it's a, actually a combination of both so mm -hmm. one thing that i recommend and uh to a lot of companies that i work with is you want to so there's the, the, there's almost two separate systems inside one ledger. You want to talk to the accounting team and the management team to figure out what is the information that they need from the system and how will they use it. And then in addition to this, you want to think through uh, with the engineering team uh, exactly how the systems will be able to kind of use balances and all those. So I definitely, I don't think it catches everything, but I think that you can uh, design a system beforehand that will catch a lot of the things and make it in a way that's modular to be mm -hmm. able to easily extend it for the future. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's talk about future proofing then. Um, we often see uh, stories of companies that you know started with a handful of tables on a relational database. Uh, it's it's super opinionated about, around their initial use case and then they built all sorts of risk models and consistency rules on top to make sure books, you know, close and things match. And then a new pro a new product comes around, a new service comes around, a new use case comes around, and things have to be refactored. Um, you know, latency spikes, and and you get reliability issues. What has been your experience in terms of like, what are the biggest mistakes people make when they're scaling their system? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. 
I, I think one of the biggest mistakes essentially is uh, building everything in the beginning in a super ad hoc nature so that mm -hmm. every single feature or money movement is essentially its own unique butterfly of a feature that becomes super, super difficult to uh, kind of reconcile and uh, figure out of how the thing would work. So one thing, w one piece that I would do is kind of systematically look through, here is every single possible financial transaction that can happen in the system. Here is the set of ledger entries and um, kind of flows that happen with that. Um, and then have a defined clear process for adding new ones and removing it so that engineers aren't guessing in terms of we need to add this new payments feature, how will it work? And then that allows essentially if all of that lives inside one system with like a clearly defined, we, we, I usually call the system like a rule book of like here's a transaction and here's how it translates to a set of ledgers. You can actually write unit tests against this to make sure like if this transaction happens and then this transaction happens, then essentially like, will it bring our system into a weird place? Right. Um, and so, yeah. How do you think about uh, enforcing these rules? Uh, actually, let me take a step back and think about the design of these rules, right? And going back all the way to the beginning on the, on the whole idea of not having uh, accounting expertise, you know, how was it for you actually designing these, these, these rule books when you're building out these, these applications? Yeah. So I think that uh, kind of initially it was super confusing and we had to make a lot of mistakes and talk to uh, kind of a lot of parties, but eventually we've settled down to like a framework to be able to think about these things. That's more clear, which is basically first, uh, you want to really map out exactly uh, kind of the business requirements of what this ledger system needs to do. Uh -huh. So if you have a successful implementation, where are the parts essentially in the code that are actually going to be interfacing with it? What information does it need? What information needs to be appeared in real time? What balances do you need to store? Um, and so basically, gather the requirements for the operational system mm -hmm. and then gather requirements for the accounting and back office system of the company too. So on the back end is like, what reports does sales need or what reports does the accounting team need in order to close the books at the end of the month? Let's say you're a mortgage business or you're like a card business and you want to be able to say like, we had X million dollars of transactions uh, a month. It's like, th these are like requirements that you would, um, look through. And then I would say you want to be able to, I think it's like, you can apply pretty accurately accounting rules to like a, a ledger system, like real accounting rules. So I, I would say like, what we initially started doing is like actually working with our accountants and saying like, here's how we're thinking about modeling our flow of funds. Does mm -hmm. this make sense? At some point, so this is, I'm going to give this piece of advice with a caveat because at some point accountants don't also understand the operational needs of the system. Right. So you might be able to add accounts in there um, that you're like, from an accounting purpose, it doesn't actually matter, but we just need this because we need this balance to display to this user at some point. So right. I almost view it as like, uh, you kind of build out the, the system of requirements, you build out the set of all the different balances that you need to display to the user, and then you build out as best you can, like a chart of account, a flow of funds, work with your accountant through it and kind of think about the, the, the system like that. So in, in the situations in which you had to do that without an accounting team, uh, it's a new company or, or perhaps you don't have the, the resources kind of available to you. Um, how much of trial and error should you, um, how much of a trial and error mentality should you uh, have when you're going in designing designing your ledger? Yeah, I think that you can have a fair bit of a trial and error mentality. And also, in addition to that, I think that you should try to make it as simple as humanly possible in the beginning, mm -hmm. right? Like, I think that if you try to adhere to all the different 
like accounting principles and uh, uh, stuff like that, then you're going to end up um, overcomplicating the system. Whereas like, what is like the simplest set of accounts and movements that you can create that will replicate the functionality and then kind of iterate through there as you discover new requirements. Right. I'm curious if you have an example of like the design um, principles, not, not necessarily design principles, but things, the ways you implemented systems you worked with before they were particularly troublesome or particularly uh, uh, productive at the end. Right. So I guess we can think about, for example, a system where you're lending out assets or something. Um, so I previously had modeled out the system in a way where every particular part of that loan was its own account. And we kept track of everything separately. Like here's the principal, here's the interest, here's the uh, interest settled and the interest accrued. But we actually found that that was representing it in too many ways. And we simplified it to like, here's the general account balance. And then we had like one interest accrued field for it as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's just like one example of like a trial and error portion of a system that we kind of went through and we discovered we oversimplified, we simplified it over time. And we realized that we didn't need all these requirements that we designed in the beginning. From that example, is it safe to say that granularity is not always good? I think it depends. I think that, that was a case of we had thought that we wanted to keep track of everything. And then when we actually looked at the business requirements, we found that it wasn't actually necessary to keep track of that. So I, I would say granularity is not always good, especially if it introduces a lot of complexity uh, into the system that you have to account for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, a complicated question is how much complexity is too much complexity, right? And, and how do you how do you manage that? Um, because on one hand, you want your system to be a reflection of the actual use cases and business needs of your of your company. Um, and then on the other hand, you also want your system to be manageable, right? I think that in, in some systems, there might be a, I think for, for money movement systems specifically, you can't really trade off consistency with any other performance criteria, right? Because money in has to equal money out and you need people to report on these things. Um, but an interesting question we face a lot is, okay, so uh, this is the, the highest level of granularity possible. Is this something that will be, you know, consistent, performant, and something that would actually serve my my use case? Um, I'm curious, we talked a lot about challenges and obstacles. Curious if there is anything that you think kind of uh, uh, works surprisingly well, or uh, I guess benefits of having a well-designed ledgering system uh, to the companies in, in which you built them. Yeah. So I think one thing that works surprisingly well is thinking throughout the holistic system in the beginning and kind of documenting it. So a process we always go through is basically get a list of all the transactions, get a list of all the different chart of accounts, get a list of how all the ledger entries affect all the chart of accounts and how, and then actually combine that with user flows. So let's say if it's a card product, it's like user signs up. Uh, and also, by the way, a transaction in this case, I define a transaction as anything that affects an account balance on a ledger. So mm -hmm. it might not actually be necessarily in the traditional way of thinking of a transaction. It's like, I bought something. It's like you opened an account, right? You would not think like, oh, an account opening is a transaction, but it can be because yeah. it can initiate a credit limit. And then it can like set off like a set of like uh, events that change something in the system. Like now funds are allocated to you. So basically I define a transaction as anything any like composable set of business logic that changes the way that balances are defined in it. So we enumerate all of those. So for example, let's take a look at like a card, right? So you create an account, um, you get assigned a credit limit, you um, go to the store and you swipe the card and then there's an authorization and there's a settlement and then you pay your bill, say you do a minimum payment you do a maximum payment and then there's like a late fee. Like all of these things are defined as a transaction. Mm -hmm. And those transactions have a set of defined ledger entries that they're uh, associated with. And then we create essentially a chart of accounts that says here is uh, the set of accounts 
um, that are linked to the system. Um, and then we also define a set of essentially user requirements, or let's call it like queries that need to exist for the system. For, so for example, we need to be able to display the user's credit limit in real time, mm -hmm. right, to the user. So we're like, okay, what accounts do we need to get information from in order to balance this? Or for example, when you swipe a card, you need to be able to know at the point of sale if there's enough money in the account or not. And it has to be like super performant. And so there's like certain things that drive decision-making around that. And I think performing that exercise and thoroughly planning how that whole system will work in the beginning um, is an incredibly useful exercise. And then also engineers know that in the future, if you need to add a new transaction or a new piece of money movement, like the logic for it is super simple and it's super the same. You go into this one app, you define a new transaction, you define a set of ledger entries, like there's zero ambiguity around how to change and modify these systems, um, which I think can be like super powerful. Another thing that I found works really well is essentially being really thoughtful and diligent around reconciliation. Right. So I think that um, I didn't realize uh, how important these systems were until you run into the first time where you give a customer like the wrong amount of money or the yeah. wrong balance and yeah. you're like and then and then the customer asks why this happened yeah and you go through it and you're like i have no idea and then you download your database and then you spend like pull an all-nighter you look through everything you find that one transaction somewhere in the past that you did that uh was wrong um and then so that becomes really painful um and so one is like if you have a defined set of transactions like i talked to uh, about before it makes finding those errors really easy Two is that you can now design, like, let's say a scheduled job that basically runs and says, here is how much I think I have in my, like my uh, FBO bank account. And here's how much my ledger says this is my FBO bank account. Mm -hmm. And then you reconcile against that. And if there's an error, you can essentially catch that error very, very quickly. And you can say, why is there a mismatch? And you can go in and you're like, oh, this user's transaction wasn't reported. We moved money into this, but it wasn't reflected any time in the system. So that's also another additional benefit of having the ledger is like, even though an auth, like you could be using a system somewhere that reports balances to you, here is your view of those systems. And if those views don't match up, you messed up somewhere and you need to kind of like go in, fix it as soon as possible. And you can uh, post adjusting entries. So actually, one piece of transaction that we always have is what we call an adjusting transaction, which yeah. is basically you just post a set of entries to just fix whatever the problem is, right? Because, and then you can kind of go through your, your like book of records and it still kind of conforms to all the audit rules and everything. You say like, here's the reason for why this adjustment was made. Here's like the regression test that is even linked to it. So I think yeah. like there's like several... I even think it's like having the ledger is useful, but the systemic way that it forces you to think about the flow of funds and how the system operates together is almost as useful as the system itself, because mm -hmm. you have to use this framework for thinking through everything. And um, like, again, this is the way accountants have been doing this for thousands of years. Yeah. Like it works, it catches issues. This is what it's designed to do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, the the immutability and the pin only design portion is is, is so important. Um, having having your your database tables that reflect money being accidentally changed is, is not a good sight for for anyone uh, when balances become become uh, uh, you know they they stop matching. Um, you you touched on uh, performance uh, briefly, and I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on that. Um, you know, we, we've known companies, public fintech companies that have like more than five ledgers. Uh, and, and sometimes the same product has multiple ledgers and they have a reconciliation ledgers that sits atop all those ledgers. And uh, the reason, one of the reasons why they, they had to think about these like discrete systems is because adding all of their information into just one single source of truth was uh, so complicated, so cumbersome 
uh, and it would you know, it would get them to the point where like one query would take way too long to get executed. Um, so curious if you have any best practices in making sure that these systems remain performant at scale. Uh, we talked about the consistency piece quite a bit in terms in using double entry, but from a performance standpoint, um, what are some of the best practices there in making sure that the the systems don't don't become slow and 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 continue to perform as you need them to? Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, the equation kind of becomes build versus buy at a certain point, which is basically the I think that you can look at a, the Ledger API and the Ledger interface initially and say like this is a really simple system to build from just like an API standpoint. And so we can go and grow, do something in-house and it makes a ton of sense. But I do think at like certain performance, uh, at certain scale, you start to get the issues that are associated with all scale, right? Like you're writing hundreds of thousands of records, you need caching, like it, it is a complex system that needs to be. So essentially you either implement like super aggressive caching aggregations like sharding of a database and it's like if your company has a devops and scaling muscle it's the same sort of muscle that can be applied to that like this system becomes a bottleneck too eventually and because it's a source of truth it's like an important bottleneck too um or or use like a solution like modern treasury basically which offers i think the scaling portion uh really well and it's like abstracts that something from the team but that's like a decision of like investment and basically like how much do you want to invest do you have a current system what's the roi on that mm -hmm. is, is getting to good performance on a ledger system inherently harder than getting to good performance on a regular database that you might buy off the shelf and, and build it in house to you know feed data into your application um i think so because like there's just a lot of correctness constraints right. that are associated with it yep. right like it's it just has to be like it's a, you you kind of go through uh this is like taking me on some computer science lessons the cap theorem right uh, uh which is like i don't remember exactly the criteria of the cap theorem but basically there's like three axes on which you can scale uh, but you have to, uh, it's like uh, consistency, optimicity, or um, performance. And basically you can like pick one of the three axes, but mm -hmm. a ledgering system requires you to kind of break the cap theorem or like yeah. extend it because it requires all three of them to yep. be present. Um, and so like, it, yeah, I think, I think it's, I think any system that has to be correct and has to be super performant, um, basically becomes, like those are constraints that make things hard to scale by definition. Yeah, yeah. Um, when, when, you, when you're talking to FinTech founders and you, when you're thinking about FinTech products that you guys are, are uh, exploring or thinking about la launching, um, what is the, the thing that you think people get wrong most often um about building a ledger i think something we've seen i don't know if you agree with this but something we've seen we we've seen a little bit of this like build it uh fix it when it breaks mentality of like just get something out get to market fast and, and and get it up and running and then once we need to actually change or there's a change in use case we will actually work around that um i'm curious like what do you've seen people get wrong most often yeah. so there's there's a bunch of them definitely the uh fix it when it breaks mentality i mean that's like prevalent in like startup thinking everywhere which is a lot of the times the correct heuristic to go by which yeah. is like ship things as quickly as possible and break it but there's a caveat here which is like okay at what scale does a system actually need to be super reliable um and if you're moving even hundreds of thousands of dollars like it should be a reliable system so like there's certain domains where move fast and break things is not as applicable, or at least there's like certain parts of the application. Reporting user balances and how much money they have is probably a place where you should slow down and actually architect it properly and make sure that it's never wrong. Yeah. Because you can be fast on like front end and feature iteration like that, but you should never be wrong. And 
be missing client funds. Like th that's, uh, so that's one piece. The other piece is like, that I've noticed is like weird requirements that um, for one reason or the other, the founder has decided is like an important requirement for their ledgering component, example, for example. Would be? Yeah, so, so a lot of the times they'll, um, people want to use like, so I think like, this is like a, a interesting example, but like, so there's a blockchain ledger, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people will say, well, that's a ledger mm -hmm. and I need a ledger too. Mm -hmm. So I need like kind of the same heuristics there, which is not what you need, right? Like if you're building a teen debit card application, you don't need a blockchain in the back end to power that sort of piece yeah. of infrastructure. Like you just need a database. Right. Blockchains are great and useful and like you can build decentralized systems with that. But if that's not what you're trying to build, that's like a definitely, uh, uh, that's not what you're trying to build. Then I think that becomes like a problematic thing uh, to try to put into there. And like, I've had like a surprising amount of conversations where people are like trying to convince me that like, uh, putting a blockchain in the back end of like an app that is like a mortgage origination app, like yeah. makes sense without the context of like, it's going to interface with like other blockchains and stuff like that. Uh, the other one is like, I mean, there's a bunch like requiring your accounting system to be like completely synced with all ledger entries uh, yeah. all the time. Right. And like trying to make zero or wave or quickbooks like your source of truth for this versus relying on like your engineering team to do this like you yeah. don't need your accounting system to be updated 100 percent of the time you don't need a huge level of granularity there um but yeah for some reason that's like uh, a requirement uh sometimes that i see i don't know there's there's been a bunch of like i think just because there's very little written on it and so people will google things that say the word ledger with them and then they'll just like try to apply those concepts that they Google there without much thought of like first principles, like what are the business outcomes I'm trying to deliver? What are the functionalities that I need to enable by using the system? And then how do, how do I actually deliver those? Yeah. Do you, so the, the blockchain example is interesting because I think immu the idea of immutability often goes hand in hand with blockchain. And I mean, you, you touched on that on your, on your answer already, but is it, is it a, a problem of just like, understanding how to build these safeguards that double entry gives you, that immutability gives you using just SQL tables. Is that, you think, is that fair to say that this is like a big part of the gap there and just defaulting to these technologies that we, that are buzzing? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I think you, you hear some of the like keywords that you want in a like successful implementation, which is like immutability. Uh, there's like cryptographic validity. Like that's like another thing. It's like, oh, I can like cryptographically verify that all of the previous entries kind of relate to this entry and it's been untampered with, right? Um, and so I think kind of once you start digging into a little bit of the requirements, it's like, but why do you want the cryptographic um, yeah. like verification? It's like, oh, to pass an audit. It's like, have you spoke with an auditor? Has an auditor required that you need <laughs> cryptographic verification? Right. And if they have, then every company will yeah. fail every single one will fail their audit no so it's like you probably don't need it you know yeah. <laughs> uh and you probably don't need to design a system that's based on this um so yeah so there so there, there there's things like that um and, and it's confusing because a lot of the words are the same and even it's like used for the same purpose but it's just just much more complex than what you need and it's and like, yeah, specifically on the blockchain example, it's like trying to achieve a different purpose, which yeah. is like it's distributed and it can be non-consensus. Um, like it, it, it's a, like it's a, it, it's distributed consensus. Sorry. But if you're running a centralized system and you yep. keep planning on keeping running it a centralized system for the foreseeable future, you don't need all those additional complexities that are involved in operating kind of like that sort of thing. So that's my view as someone who's like pretty knowledgeable about like blockchains too, like have worked with a lot of cryptocurrency companies. It's like, I even advise them. It's like, do not use a blockchain for this. Use like, yeah. maybe that's why I'm like jaded by that is because <laughs> everyone like instantly wants to go there. I'm like, let's take a step back and think through like something a little bit simpler maybe for this. 
yeah yeah uh square pegs and and round holes right like yeah using, exactly using the right tool for the right the right task um i will go back as well and i'll ask about the the whole idea of using quickbooks and netsuite and zero and all these like accounting uh software uh products to like actually keep very granular granular user balances i mean that the APIs these products offer are, are probably not good enough for it to actually fulfill these use cases, right? Like, what's your experience? Uh, yeah. What do you tell like, a founder that's, like, trying to think about using that for their ledger? Yeah. So, I mean, like, NetSuite has a SOAP API, right? It's, like, <laughs> it's it's not REST. It's not yeah. Graph. It's a SOAP-based API, right? right? So, it's, like, unless you want your engineers to, like, figure out how to parse XML and, like, SOAP, <laughs> from that suite and like do this uh to display this like maybe NetSuite should not be your source of truth for that and right. and the systems uh like you can kind of look at the messaging and who they're building for like if you spoke to a product manager at quickbooks and you spoke to a product manager at NetSuite, like who are you building these systems for it's yeah. like the finance team the accountant to reconcile their books and surround the business it's like do you think about the developer ever like in your life have you thought about the developer experience of integrating this as an operational system yeah. and um yeah, not to like you know like disparage like quickbooks on anything but that's like not what they're trying to do like that right. is not their bread and butter that's not what their product is and so essentially sure you can you're like yeah th this is another instance of like but it has a ledger right like oh yeah but you can try to macgyver quickbooks or zero to work in the way that you want it to work but it's just not designed and it's just going to make your life super difficult and um yeah so it's 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 this is like one of those places where you're just in introducing unneeded complexity into the system and like simple is better if you you can just remove hundreds of the features that it has and just boil it down to like literally the core accounting fundamentals to it which becomes drastically simpler yep yep so um, I think we talked a lot about what could go wrong and, and um, things to avoid. Um, I guess a question that comes to mind is, what are the ways in which someone who's building a ledgering system today can stress test their system? Because um, one of the things we talked about is the idea that you, you, you don't know that it goes, that it's like not built properly until something breaks. And then when it breaks, it's like urgent and you have to actually address it. Uh, if there's, you know, wrong customer balances, that's, that's an emergency. Uh, but what's a way a developer can actually look at their system and, and stress test it, right? Assuming that all the, the debits are, are matching the credits and the balances are, are evening out. Um, what is a way for you to know that you're doing it right? Yeah, exactly. So there's a couple of tools that you can use. One is you can have invariance on balances, basically. Like a balance can never be negative. A balance can never be over a certain amount or like something like that. And something it's like, if this place expects something, let's say positive and it becomes negative, like you instantly know that the system is broken and there, there's something there. The other advantage of writing essentially transactions and ledger entries in the format of code is now you can unit test your logic regarding this so you can actually write comprehensive unit tests of like chaining transactions together and see like can you get these sort of weird states that this happens to the point where like i've seen companies uh, i know newbank does this which is like they do generative testing so they'll mm. test out all the different possible iterations um and they'll be able to like find a lot of like weird edge cases like that uh in addition to this um Another place to stress is running a reconciliation job, basically, mm -hmm. which is a thing that monitors balances and then verifies it against real world systems. And if there's discrepancies there, you can find it. And then the third part, which is not 100% an answer to your question, but is related to it, is finding a way to remediate those issues really quickly. So if mm -hmm. an issue arises, like just like you have a pager duty rotation and you have like a book, which is like if something goes wrong, Here's like the book to, to go, like a handbook to go through and debug these sort of systems and have like, if a payment is wrong, here's like a really quick way to go and fix it. So one is like, go in, figure out where the payment is wrong, like post adjusting entry very, very quickly. 
uh, then kind of run through like the testing suite and run through the code, see where something is, like add a regression to it. Um, uh, and yeah, so sort of like implement plans for addressing things quickly so that even if a mistake happens, it's actually not a big deal. Right. Right. Tom, I think we could keep nerding out about this for another uh, hour. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you have any final words of advice for people thinking about this or uh, dealing with building their first ledger or scaling their current ledger, you know, both developers, but also founders, any, any parting words of advice? Cool. Yeah. Like I would just say, think about it. Don't ignore it. Don't put it off into the future because if you spend a little bit of time thinking about it now, it could just save you like a ton of pain in the future is basically my general recommendation on this. Cool. Yeah. We definitely, we definitely resonate with that. I think there's a lot of gain into, um, there's a lot of benefit in, in thinking about these things from first principles and understanding what you need to build before you actually get started. But then, and then when you do so, you, you get to do it pretty fast, actually faster than you would expect because you're, you're, you're doing it the right way. Um, yeah, exactly. Tom, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, hopefully we get the chance to talk more about ledgering and, and payments in FinTech soon. Cool. Thanks so much. Appreciate you inviting me.